Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blundy Hacks. I'm working on my locomotive this week, and I'm going to make the return cranks. These are the little arms that actually drive the valves, so we are very close to having this thing run on air for the first time. So let's go. Back here on the main rod crank pin, there's extra space for the return crank, and that's what actually swings the expansion link back and forth and ultimately moves the valve. So pretty important little thing back here. I've got some 4140 that I'm going to make these two return cranks from. We need two, of course. And I'm going to be making them end to end on one piece, very similar to how I did the link brackets, if you watched that video. And similar to that video, it starts over here on the hearth, because I'm going to normalize this piece, just to make sure that nothing warps while I machine it. Heat that to a glowing orangish red, let it cool down, and we can machine with confidence. And hey, this is Blondie Hacks, you know the drill. If it doesn't start on the hearth, it starts on the bandsaw. This piece is quite a bit too wide, and I don't want to wear out my cutters milling all that away, so lop it off on the bandsaw. And now I can start over on the milling machine by squaring this piece up and bringing it to the final outermost dimensions of the pair of return cranks. When I first started out machining, I used to do the proper squaring of stock procedure anytime I started a part like this. And somewhere along the way, I figured out that Honestly, that almost never matters. It's extremely rare that a part actually needs to be as square as is possible to make a part on a milling machine, and it's just good enough to square it up approximately with the quickest series of operations like you see here. Getting quicker in the machine shop is very much about understanding where accuracy and precision matter and where they don't, because accuracy and precision take time, and they almost never matter as much as the enthusiastic beginner thinks that they do. Of course, you may be watching my videos and think, oh, I would do everything to a much better standard than that, and some other people watch and tell me I'm way too fussy about everything. So there's obviously a personal choice involved here as well. You can do any of these parts to whatever level of care that you want to do. The return cranks have two holes each, so I'm starting by drilling all four of these across with a pilot drill. I've got a reference on each end using the absolute and incremental scales in my DRO, so each return crank has its own reference. And the two center holes get reamed for the pin that goes through the eccentric rod that drives the valve. And then the outer two holes get enlarged and reamed to the size of the main crank pins. Obviously the distance between these holes is the most critical dimension on the part because that sets the throw of the return crank. It's obviously a key portion of the design of any steam locomotive valve gear, but eh, in the land of the DRO, that's very easy to achieve. Now I flip the part on edge, and I'm going to drill a pilot hole all the way through the short, long way, the long way on the short side, you know what I mean, and this is going to form the clamping mechanism. Then I thread the top half of each of these. I'm actually threading a little bit below halfway just to make sure I get to halfway with full thread depth. And then the other side is going to be clearance drilled to halfway, so if we make too many threads in here, they'll get removed by the next step. To do that clearance drilling, I throw an end stop in here to save me a bunch of extra edge finding so that I can flip the part over, and I've still got my DRO values set from the last set of edge finding that I did. In case it's not obvious, the ends of these cranks get split later on and form a clamping mechanism that clamps on the crank pin. The reason that's needed is because you need to be able to adjust the orientation or the timing of this return crank on the crank pin itself, and that's how you set the valve timing. So we've got a threaded hole to the halfway point on one side, a clearance hole to the halfway point on the other, a slit between them, and then a bolt through, and that will form the clamp. Next step then is I'm going to blue this up and do some layout because all of the critical internal functional stuff is done and the rest of the work was really just cosmetic on these. And I'm going to lay out all of the key distances and points on the surface to form the outer shapes of these return cranks. As you can see from the drawing in the corner, it's quite a complicated shape, but it really just boils down to a couple of rotary table cuts and a couple of angle cuts between these key tangent points that I've laid out on the piece. I'll do the rotary table cuts next. I like to get these out of the way because they're always a little tricky. I'll line up the center reference hole with a gauge pin in my chuck, and then the other end gets clamped down to hold that in place while I retract the reference pin 
and put a second clamping bolt down through the middle. The holes in this piece are conveniently large enough that I can get a bolt right through it into my sacrificial fixture plate. So I don't have to use two strap clamps, which gets pretty awkward when doing features like this. Then I empirically determine the start and ending angles of these curved cuts by lining up a gauge pin the diameter of my cutter with the layout lines. I really like this empirical angle determination method because it means it doesn't matter how the part is oriented on the rotary table. You don't have to dial it in or indicate it in with zero or use some sort of reference to get it on zero, which is both the most time consuming part of this process and the most error prone, especially on very short pieces like this. It's difficult to get something exactly aligned with zero when it's short. And so your angles then end up not very accurate, even if you've done the math right for where to start and stop these cuts. But since these are just cosmetic features, lining it up with the layout lines and cutting to those works really well. This is my favorite method for doing it. Then to keep tool pressure low and prevent chatter, I plunge both ends of the curved feature using the angles that I determined in the previous step. And then I cut between them with one side milling cut on the rotary table. And that way you're not ever having too much engagement all the way around the circumference of the cutter which tends to leave a poor finish and tends to cause chatter and deflection in a very small end mill like this. So here's the other side shown sped up so you can see the whole process. Do a series of plunge cuts at each end to establish the ends of the cuts. And then I come in and do one final sweep to connect the dots. This approach always guarantees nice results for me with these very small end mills. That's gone really well. I can pull that off of there. Then I flip it around and do the same thing on the other end. And after that, I end up with this piece, which probably made all the Green Lanterns fans in the audience giggle. I decided to do the slit cut on the clamps at the ends next. I'm going to set this up with a technique I learned very recently from Stefan Gottsvinger for touching off a slitting saw accurately and without damaging the work. You put a dial indicator on the quill so that it moves with the saw, put a little preload on it, and then move it down until the saw just touches the work and you'll see the needle deflect when the saw is touching the work. And then you back it off until the point where the needle is just gonna start to move. And then I do the same thing on the bottom, divide those quill DRO readings by two, and there's my center line. I used to do this with a feeler gauge, again, so that the saw isn't spinning and you're not scratching up the work. And that works okay, it's not great. There's a lot of feel and technique with feeler gauges and it doesn't work all that reliably. But this method kind of melted my brain because it's obvious once you see it, but it's very clever, very simple, very fast, works great. So thanks, Stefan. Now I'll make one cut through here with the slitting saw and that should be our clamp feature. And because these pieces are both, of course, on the same level as it were, they're both in line with each other, I flip the part around and do the same cut without moving the saw. I don't have to redial anything in. The next operation I will do is to remove the excess material on the wings of the clamps. I wanted to do the slitting saw cut before this because once these cuts are done, I lose my reliable vertical centering reference. These cuts are being done cosmetically, essentially. I'm bringing these surfaces down until they line up nicely with the curves on either side, which may or may not be perfect. I mean, they should be close, but before these cuts were made, I had perfect vertical height references. So I could find the center line of those bores and know that my slitting saw cuts were correct. And getting those slitting saw cuts correctly centered is quite important. So that's why I did that first. Next, I'm going to remove the area in the center, and this is like a utilitarian cut. This is ostensibly unnecessary because the center area is all going to be tapered after this. However, I need to remove this material in order to set up the next cut. The back of each return crank has a thinned out area that ends in a nice fillet. So we need to do a long side milling cut across both pieces to do that. And the cutter I need to use doesn't have enough flute depth to do that entire piece of raw stock. So that's why I thinned it out in the middle and I've got a nice reference surface there. It's still parallel to the center lines of the holes. So I can line that up with the top of a one, two, three block and side mill my way to victory. I'll edge find on the front of that to get the depth and I'm edge finding on a gauge pin in each of the two holes. Again, using two separate references to get the ending point where the fillet needs to land. 
and now I can plunge both ends of the filleted area, very similar to how I did the link blocks once again, or the link brackets rather, if you saw that video. Plunge the ends and then side mill between them, and life is good. Again, same as the link brackets, I'm doing the side milling in between by roughing it in in two levels as it were. I'm cutting halfway down, cutting all the way close to final depth, and then doing a second pass with the cutter further down just so the cutter isn't doing too much side milling at once. With a tiny end mill like this, if you try to load it up all the way up its length, you're just going to get a bunch of deflection and probably some chatter and so on. So try not to make the cutter do too much work, and then I leave myself a really light cut that I can do full height all the way across, unify the surface, get a nice finish, no weird tool marks, and life is good once again. These parts are surprisingly extremely similar to the link brackets, so the milling strategy that I used there worked so well, so hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The depth of that cut was determined with the DRO, of course, but I can double check it by measuring across the entire fixture assembly, and of course, subtracting an inch for the 1-2-3 block. Next I'll do the taper cuts. I've laid those out on the piece by connecting the dots that we previously made on the surface plate, and now I'm lining up the first of those taper cut lines using a parallel on the top of my vise jaw, and then I'll mill down to that layout line. With these decorative or cosmetic taper cuts, it's, I find much easier to just lay it out like this rather than trying to calculate the angle and set it with angle blocks and so on. There's a lot of sources of error in doing that, and you may not actually end up with a better result depending on how well machined some of the other features are. For example, in this case, the most important thing really is that it lines up nicely with the tangent of the curve next to it. It doesn't actually matter what the angle of this taper cut is, it just needs to look nice. And if the priority is that something look nice, then it's actually better to do it by eye in my experience. That went great, so do that three more times and we end up with this contraption. This is all the operations needed on the two parts while they're still together. So that chunk of waste in the middle can go away now. So now it's time to go back to the bandsaw and cut them apart. I left myself a generous amount of waste material between the two parts so that I wouldn't have any trouble bandsawing them. I didn't have to risk getting them too close together and really painting myself into a corner. I left a little more material than necessary though, so I knocked off the excess with a file because that'll make the next step easier, which is to round the ends. For that, I will use my end rounding fixture on my belt sander. I really like this thing. Anywhere that I can use it, I do, because it's super easy, really fast, and makes very nice results. I knock off those extra little chunks of waste once again, and then sweep it around to create the curves on the ends. What's great about this fixture is the more you use it, the faster it gets, because as you can see, I've got almost a dozen holes drilled in it at this point. I've got special pins made for each of those holes that I keep with the fixture. So the longer you use it, the more likely it is you already have the pin that you need and you don't have to make anything or do any setup work. Next, the vertical end where the clamping feature is gets rounded as well. So I made a pin that fits the clearance hole that we drilled in one half of the clamp. So the clamp can slide right over that pin vertically, and I can round the end of that same way. This is a little bit dicier because you got to get your hot dogs a little close to the meat grinder there, but, you know, do it carefully and uh, don't touch the belt. Simple. Then a little bit of scotch bright work to remove tool marks and belt sander marks, and these are the final return cranks. I'm very, very pleased with those. One of the things I love about building this locomotive is that because Kozo has a lot of suggested order of operations, it takes away a lot of the intimidation factor of these really complicated parts. If I just looked at a drawing for this part, I might be really at a loss for how to start, how to create such a complex shape, but Kozo's books are like a training ground for figuring out how to machine complicated shapes from bar stock. Okay, let's get these on the locomotive. They go, of course, on the crank pins, as I said at the top of the show. Those should be a really snug fit, but they should slide on. 
so that the clamp doesn't have much work to do. You don't want that clamp to have to compress more than a thousandth or two. A little screw goes in the end and snug that down and that now won't move at all. So the clamping action is working. Very nice. And there it is. I've just thrown those on at an arbitrary angle. They will of course need timing. They need to be set 90 degrees off the angle of the crank rod on the main pin and then the lead uh, needs to be tuned as well. But for now they are on there. We'll worry about valve timing later. This is a very cool stage to be at. We're one part away from this locomotive running on air. So exciting. Thank you for sticking with me. Thanks to my patrons for making all this happen, and I'll see you next time.